Good evening. Welcome to the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation. I'm Bob Perry, the museum's executive director. I'm going to take my mask off. <laughs> it's my pleasure to welcome three distinct audiences to tonight's Mill Talk, being delivered by Dr. Patrick Malone our in-house, in-person audience here at the museum this evening, which is a real treat after so many months of just live streaming. Our second audience, of course, is online watching this presentation live. And we've got a third audience also online who will take this all in in the future. So to each and all of you, welcome. I thank the Lowell Institute for their generous support of our Mill Talk series. Among many other extraordinary contributions to the civic life in our region, the Lowell Institute has been making grants to support free lectures in Greater Boston since, get this, 1836, continuously. Please note also that there will be a question and answer period following this talk, which will be facilitated by an esteemed colleague of ours, historian Dr. Kate Viennes. Brown University Professor Emeritus Patrick Malone is an industrial archaeologist and a historian of technology. He has served as president of the Society for Industrial Archaeology and is executive director of the Slater Mill Historic Site in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Pat's invaluable publications include Water Power in Lowell, which I'm carrying like a Bible this evening, and The Texture of Industry, which he co-authored with Robert Gordon. Professor Malone's primary interests are the urban built environment and industrial development. He has also done a great deal of work in public humanities, focusing on museum interpretation, park development, historical preservation, and the recording of engineering structures. Much of his scholarship examines American rivers and hydraulic engineering. Accordingly, his more recent research has focused on a unique tidal power system in 19th century Boston, into which he shared insights in November of 2019 uh, at his excellent but unrecorded <coughs> mill talk, The Back Bay Connection, Waltham and Perpetual Power. Any of you, some of you actually in this room tonight were here at that talk. Um, you're the only person in the world who saw it or heard it. Um, and anyway, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great privilege to welcome a great leader in the field of industrial archaeology and a great friend to researchers and to museum -like, museums like ours. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Patrick Malone. Thank you, Bob. <coughs> it's a pleasure to be back at the Charles River Museum. Uh, <coughs> and talking about this subject is uh, dear to my heart. Uh, I really uh, have been working on Cities at the Falls for quite a while, uh, and tonight I hope to, uh, to give you a broad look at some of the water power development that helped uh, to create industrial America. <clears throat> water power spurred the industrialization of the United States and was the dominant form of power for its manufacturing until well after the Civil War. In 1790, the new nation had approximately 7,500 water mills. By 1840, it had over 55,000, including the Moffett machine shop and dam. And let me see if I can get this up here. In uh, Lincoln, Rhode Island. So you can see the uh, Moffett machine shop on the left and the, and the dam in the center. A recent presentation by Dave Coughlin for the Society for Industrial Archaeology revealed that there were 152 water-powered sawmills and 32 grist mills in Hillsborough County, New Hampshire in 1858. The vast majority of early American mills were in rural settings <coughs> or small communities like Clayville, Rhode Island. But production centers grew at major drops on many rivers, particularly those in the eastern half of the United States. The convenient leak in the elevated flume at Clayville uh, reveals the path of water to the mill. Some communities that lacked sites for riverine water power had enough tidal rise and fall to drive mills. The Tide Mill Institute has cataloged more than 400 tide mills on the east coast. The vast majority were in New England or New York, but some were scattered as far south as Georgia. In the typical pattern, a small dam with automatic entry gates and a natural 
<coughs> inlet or estuary, uh, created a mill pond with enough capacity and drop for one or two mills. There were only a few concentrations of tidal powered manufacturing in or near major seaports. Boston had a tide mill as early as 1633 and a substantial dam uh, with multiple mills in the 1640s. On this uh, 1722 map uh, by Bonner, uh, you can see the, uh, the mill pond indicated uh, at the upper right. <coughs> there also was a massive development uh, for perpetual power next to Boston Common by uh, 1821, so that would be coming uh, in the area off to the left. Local speculators developed a unique system that could operate around the clock with the seven to 10 foot falls from a full to an empty or receiving basin. The main dam is still under Beacon Street with some of the cross dam under Mass Avenue. All six lessees uh, are on this particular map uh, <coughs> from 1852, uh, which is at the uh, Levenfall Center. The Baldwin Sawmill was south of these five uh, sites. The full basin is to the left, and the receiving basin is on the right. When the first water power volume of the 1880 census appeared, its editor made the following claim. Quote, it is probably safe to say that in no other country in the world is an equal amount of water power utilized, and that not only in regard to the aggregate employed, but in regard also to the number and importance of large improved powers, this country stands preeminent. The most successful of those large improved powers was the famous one at Lowell shown here in 1876 with a population of about 50,000. The location of this city at Pawtucket Falls on the Merrimack River was no accident. The tremendous water power potential of the site, only 27 miles from Boston, attracted a massive surge of capital investment beginning in 1821. Earlier success of water-powered textile manufacturing <coughs> by Samuel Slater at Pawtucket in 1793, and by Francis Cabot Lowell at Waltham in 1814, gave developers confidence. Nathan Appleton was one of the Boston associates who founded the Boston Manufacturing Company in Waltham and the Merrimack Manufacturing Company in Lowell. In 1810, while investigating the British textile industry, he visited the utopian community of New Lanark, Scotland where he saw a canal <coughs> designed to power multiple factories. On this 1857 map of New Lanark, the dam is off the screen at the lower right with the river flowing to the upper left. A 300 meter tunnel feeds the power canal running parallel to the river. A line of mills sits between the canal and the lower river. Now let me point, this is the tunnel, the canal, and the line of mills along the river. There was about 35 uh, feet of head at this particular site, uh, and they developed the largest set of water-powered mills in Great Britain, using a total of 650 horsepower. The development at Waltham followed this ideal New Atlantic layout with a power canal parallel to the river and supplying several mills. <clears throat> this uh, painting from uh, 1825, or circa 1825, by Elijah Smith uh, is now at Gore Place. Uh, it shows uh, the first two mills uh, and the dam uh, at the left. Uh, and the hidden canal is running uh, on the far side of these mills. Power in the uh, great city on the Merrimack was always leased by mill powers. The second mill here 
from 1817, which is the larger of the two, was the model for the first mills in Lowell. And the mill power in Lowell, uh, which was leased to the various corporations, was equal to the 85 gross horsepower used at that Waltham mill. You start to calculate water power by multiplying the flow in cubic feet per second times the drop in feet. Here we have the, uh, the first mill uh, modified over time, uh, completed in 1814, uh, and the power canal entrance, though the canal is now blocked uh, and covered by a parking lot. The dam uh, was to the right, and in this uh, bird's eye view uh, from 1877, you can see the canal and its relation to the dam. This Barlow insurance uh, plan from the American Textile History Museum uh, dates from 1874. It's important because it includes dotted raceways uh, to the three mills. The power canal supplies mills number one, two, four, and probably the machine shop. Mill number three, built in 1821 and powered by an imported iron water wheel, was downstream at the separate bleachery dam. The Boston Manufacturing Company bought uh, the, uh, the bleachery dam and the site of the Waltham Cotton and Woolen Company uh, after an 1816 lawsuit, uh, which resulted in the lowering of that dam. They were putting backwater on the, uh, the site uh, here at the Boston Manufacturing Company. The challenges in Lowell uh, <coughs> were much greater. And in the 1820s, engineers, industrialists, and construction crews rapidly transformed the rural village of East Chelmsford with clusters of small mills and a failing transportation canal into a booming center for textile production and machine building. Uh, this map of 1821 uh, shows uh, the, uh, the falls at the, uh, at the left uh, and the Pawtucket Canal running around avoiding those falls, uh, coming from the Merrimack and re-entering at the junction with the Concord River. The area in between is what would become uh, the heart of Lowell. Among the many men who came to build canals was a crew of Irishmen led by Hugh Comiskey, who'd helped to create the Back Bay Tidal Power System. The two-level canal system in Lowell became the principal supplier of power for Lowell's major corporations. It also transported raw materials and products. This drawing uh, by the Historic American Engineering Record uh, is essentially a, a schematic showing the two-level canal system as it was fully developed by 1848. The uh, map is color-coded, so there are two levels. The upper level is in light blue, and the uh, lower level is in dark blue. Uh, the junction of a number of canals is here as the swamp locks. And this is where the Pawtucket Canal, which has been uh, reused uh, as a power canal uh, while still retaining its transportation function, uh, drops 13 feet. Uh, so we have a drop here uh, of 13 feet into uh, the, uh, the lower level of the Pawtucket Canal and on down to the uh, Eastern Canal. All of the water is used twice except at the Merrimack Mills, which gets a direct shot and a full drop of 30 feet. Uh, the other mills uh, get either uh, 13 or 17. The way that they uh, made the mill powers equal on each level was by uh, adjusting uh, the flow rate for each mill power. So at 30 feet, it was 25 cubic feet per second. 
At 17 feet, it was 45.5 cubic feet per second. And at 13, it was 60.5 uh, cubic feet per second. Now, I want you to focus on this particular area because we're going to zoom in to an 1825 uh, map uh, that shows uh, the Hamilton Canal uh, as planned in 1825. Uh, it, this is an upper level canal with a drop of 13 feet. Uh, and after powering the Hamilton and Appleton mills, which are in line here, water from the Hamilton Canal discharged into the lower level of the narrowed Pawtucket Canal with 17 feet of head remaining for additional mills. Now on a small scale, this is the same type of parallel arrangement that we saw at New Lanark and at Waltham. In a two-level canal system like the one in Lowell, most of the water is used twice, first on the upper level and then on the lower level. Chuck Parrott drew this diagram for my book about the city's water power. You can see the upper level canal uh, coming uh, directly from the dam or the mill pond above the dam uh, and driving mill number one. Uh, the discharge goes into a lower level canal uh, which then drives mill number two uh, and the final discharge through a tail race uh, is to the river below the falls. The water wheels at Lowell, as at Waltham, were high breast wheels with an efficiency of somewhere between uh, 60 and 64 percent. This drawing from the Center for Lowell History shows tests on such a wheel in 1844. John Dummer, a millwright who'd been employed by Paul Moody at Waltham, built this high breast wheel for the Locks and Canals machine shop. He also made the first wheels for the Back Bay tidal power system. James Montgomery, a British textile expert who worked in and reported on the American cotton industry in 1840, said that the principal manufacturing town in the United States is that of Lowell, which may justly be denominated the Manchester of America. He noted that, quote, in general, the mills throughout the United States are moved by water. Indeed, the water power resources of this country are incalculable, and many years must elapse before they can be fully brought into use. At mid-century, 10 textile mill complexes and a great machine shop drew water from the Merrimack at Lowell. The chief engineer and agent of the five-mile canal system operated by the proprietors of locks and canals was James B. Francis. A gifted designer of hydraulic structures and machinery and an astute manager of water power uh, distribution. His contributions to the development of the mixed flow turbine improved the efficiency and rotational speed of these important prime movers that quickly replaced most of America's vertical water wheels. One of their great advantages was that they could run in backwater when rivers rose to flood wheel pits. The Pawtucket Gatehouse and the Northern Canal are well preserved. Even the first Francis turbine of 1847 is still in place, submerged in a cylindrical stone wheel pit. Promenading on the Great River Wall of the Northern Canal was popular, but this postcard is misleading. The entire flow of the Merrimack was diverted <coughs> into the canals during the workday in dry seasons. Francis supported the corporate landscaping program that made his complex canal system a notable urban amenity, as well as a source of industrial power. His tree-lined canals were the first greenways in America. Land speculators and aspiring industrial barons all over America dreamed of creating another Lowell. Water power visions often exceeded reality. John Quincy Adams predicted that Zanesville, Ohio would become, quote, the Lowell of the West. Henry Clay was even more optimistic. 
implying that water power from the Muskingum River made Zanesville the, quote, best manufacturing site in the United States. Unfortunately, there turned out to be more seasonal variation in the Muskingum's flow than promoters expected. The variation in flow and unreliability were, were problems at many water power sites. <clears throat> Planners who had lived or worked in Lowell played essential roles in building new cities and water power systems at waterfalls. Young Ezekiah Straw laid out most of Manchester, New Hampshire for the Amiskeg Manufacturing Company in the 1830s, creating a two-level canal system parallel to the Merrimack River. The dam at the lower left uh, <coughs> appears just in a part of the view, uh, but the river is flowing uh, to the right. You can see here uh, two rows of, of mills, uh, and then stepping up the hillside, housing uh, for the workers, uh, and then a large main street with parks beyond. This complex that he laid out with the two-level canal system parallel to the Merrimack River uh, was a, a very effective layout. In the following decade, Charles Starro was responsible for the initial design of Lawrence, Massachusetts, for the Essex Company. There, one canal avoided the difficulties of balancing flow on two levels. Relatively straight stretches of river at both Manchester and Lawrence meant that canals and streams could be placed parallel to the channel. In their urban forms, uh, these cities were not close copies of Lowell, but the year-round or permanent water power potential at all three sites was similar, from 11,000 to 16,000 gross horsepower. All lease powers by mill powers equal to the 85 gross horsepower of the second mill at Waltham. Thoreau urged his uh, readers to look at what he called a silver cascade as the Merrimack River, quote, falls all the way from the White Mountains to the sea, and behold a city on each successive plateau, a busy colony of human beaver around every fall. However, rational urban planning and available water power did not bring immediate economic success to all ventures. Lawrence was slow to find lessees for all of its permanent or year-round water power, and exploitation of immigrant workers tarnished its image. At Holyoke, Massachusetts, <clears throat> where the first dam collapsed right after construction in 1848, a rebuilt Connecticut River dam and a three-level power system offered more water power in mill sites than there were buyers. The 1880 census said that nearly all the permanent available power is utilized at Lawrence, but considerable power is still available at Holyoke. The continued expansion of its flourishing paper industry compensated for the stalled growth of Holyoke's textile industries. Uh, this community had a 56-foot drop uh, and mills, uh, particularly paper mills, uh, ran at night as well as in the daytime. Lowell had no difficulty leasing all its permanent water power. And for most of the 19th century, its industrial growth seemed to have no limits. The city was an inspiration, not only in New England, but for promoters of industrial communities large and small all over America. When urban boosters invoked the name of Lowell like a talisman, they hoped its aura would steal their resolve and convince others to invest in their dream. There were justifiable hopes for Minneapolis, where the mighty Mississippi spilled over a spectacular cataract at St. Anthony's Falls. Some residents of Minneapolis had actually wanted to name the place Lowell. There were really two cities here until 1872. 
uh, when they merged. And there were separate power companies on either side of the river. Uh, Minneapolis never fully exploited all of the water power that was available. Uh, the dam was constructed in 1857, and it made over 50 feet uh, possible, uh, but most of the mills were really using uh, 35 feet or less. In fact, in 1880, there, there was only uh, 13,000 horsepower uh, <coughs> in uh, the entire both sides of the river. Uh, the uh, complex uh, later became uh, much more effective in uh, generating power uh, once they uh, started using electrical generation. On the west side of the river, you had a great canal uh, which fed a large number of flour mills. Uh, and it was unusual because the mills were on both sides of the canal. So some of the mills were on the inland side. Uh, and you see the ruins of one of those here. Uh, the canal is empty. You can see it on the right. Uh, it's empty because the, uh, the lock that you saw on the previous uh, slide uh, actually uh, ended uh, water power development on the west side of the river. It ran right over uh, the, uh, the canal. <clears throat> but here uh, in this ruin, you can see a draft tube from a turbine uh, that powered this mill. The water would have run into the mill at an upper level gone through the turbine, and then it had to discharge into a tail race tunnel that would run under uh, the power canal. So that was a, a somewhat unusual layout, but they, they did it in a number of spots uh, in Minneapolis. Water power here drove the largest flour mills uh, uh, in the world. Lowell also helped to inspire significant uh, water power development at the steep falls of the Mohawk in Cohoes, New York, where a six-level canal system with 120 feet of head uh, may have set a record for hydraulic complexity. A long canal or a long tail race can take advantage of additional drop in a sloping river below a dam or falls. And you can see the town of Cohoes in the distance uh, at uh, just right of center. Even when a city government took on its own water power and canal transportation projects, as at Augusta, Georgia in 1845, the Lowell ideal was inspirational. Both white workers and enslaved black men built the first canal, while large numbers of Chinese laborers were hired for the enlargement in 1875. The Sibley Cotton Mill, built in 1882, retained the Confederate powder works stack. It's kind of a memorial of the Confederacy. The 1862 powder works used the Augusta Canal and internal raceways for power and to transport materials within its two-mile-long, 28-building complex. Industrialization in the New South of the late 19th century was often water power. Augusta used water power from the upper level of its seven-mile canal uh, to pump water for its citizens, uh, in addition to providing uh, power for industry. In general, James B. Francis seemed unimpressed with European water power sites because few were developed in what he called a systematic manner from their inception. Lawrence was a good example of this approach. In his presidential address for the American Society of Civil Engineers in 1881, Francis provided a full description of the usual process of developing a large water power in America. 
First investors formed a company and bought enough land for a town to accommodate the population, which is sure to gather around and improve water power. Then workers built the dam and necessary canals. The company granted mill sites with accompanying rights to the use of the water, usually by perpetual leases subject to annual rents. He said that this method of development was distinctly an American idea. Many manufacturing companies chose to develop smaller water power sites for their own exclusive use as the Collins uh, Company, a noted producer of axes and machetes, did on the Farmington River in Collinsville, Connecticut. By 1865, Samuel Collins had a dam and mill pond at the site, <clears throat> an upstream reservoir at Otis for additional water storage, and a sprawling complex with 12 turbines and a water wheel distributed among various buildings. This layout with underground channels and open raceways uh, was a decentralized installation that reduced the need for lengthy and inefficient mechanical transmission of power. Flour and box mills in Rochester, New York, paper mills in Watertown, New York, and lumber mills on rivers in Minnesota and Wisconsin were major users of water power. The same rivers that provided power for grinding wood to pulp or for sawing timber into boards could deliver logs from upstream forests. Minneapolis made much more than flour at St. Anthony's Falls. The city also was renowned for the vast number of floating logs behind the booms that supplied its saw and paper mills. Industrial communities in the American West were generally slower to develop and owed less to eastern water-powered models. But Oregon City at Willamette Falls and some other lumber and paper mill towns in the Northwest show significant influence. Oregon City was developed after 1838 uh, and had a 40-foot drop. Mining towns in the Rockies and in California's Sierras made more use of direct drive water power than historians realize for sawing mine timbers, stamping ores, pumping water, etc. And they contributed technological advances in impulse turbines for high head applications. Once hydroelectric generation was possible, the mining industry financed numerous power plants. Great Falls on the Missouri River and other water power sites in Montana supplied electricity to smelters, refineries, mines, mine hoists, mills, and railroads of the giant Anaconda Copper Company, which controlled the Montana Power Company after, 18, after 1912. Over time, as the larger direct drive water power sites were intensely developed, the problems of dividing and distributing water among multiple users became more difficult. When one company or manufacturer uh, controlled all of the water at a particular fall or dam, as in Lowell, it was possible for a single engineer like James Francis to distribute water and monitor its use with the staff of assistants. The situation was more complex at a site like Woonsocket, Rhode Island, which may have had the largest canal system in the United States to be created without centralized planning or engineering oversight. The average flow at Woonsocket was much less than at Lowell, but both communities had canal systems with two levels and a total drop of over 30 feet. On this 1862 map, the Blackstone River comes down from the upper left and passes over two dams before departing on the upper right. Disputes over water distribution in Woonsocket led to a lawsuit in 1842 that involved everyone with water privileges at the falls. The federal court named engineer Samuel Cushing as its, quote, master in chancery, unquote to find a solution for this problem. 
It then empowered him to manage the system with fees paid by the water power users. Amazingly, the case remained open with a sequence of court-appointed engineers in charge until 1961. By then, there was no longer any water power in use and no need for a master. Lawsuits over water power, including the problems caused by dams, were among the most common types of litigation in the eastern United States during the 19th century. The potential costs of legal action as either plaintiff or defendant was one of the downsides of operating water-powered industry. People fought frequently in court over water allocations, diversion of water courses, hours of manufacturing, blockage of fish runs, and heights of dams and mill power. If your mill pond uh, was too high, it could flood upstream wheel pits, farms, and woodlots, uh, and they were likely to sue you. When water-powered mills used tail races and rivers as sinks for their industrial and human wastes, as with this toilet tower uh, in Patterson, New Jersey, they often ruined the quality of water for processes and domestic uh, consumption further downstream. There was also the chance of disaster at vulnerable riverside locations from either natural or human causes. Freshets halted water wheels and sometimes submerged production machinery. This Patterson site is also important because it's one of the first efforts to plan an industrial community. The Society for Useful Manufacturers was set up in 1791 uh, and tried to develop this site, but uh, it was a relatively uh, slow movement. Uh, eventually, three levels of canals uh, with a total drop of 66 feet uh, were operating in Patterson. Occasionally, a dam failed and created havoc. When a poorly designed gravity dam at a storage reservoir on the Mill River in Massachusetts gave way in 1874, letting loose a great surge of water, 139 people lost their lives and many factories were ruined. Here you can see at the top uh, the brass works of the, uh, the, the Haydensville plant. Uh, before the flood, uh, you can see the damage that the flood did in the middle, and then you can see the rebuilt site. Uh, they rebuilt both the dam uh, and the, uh, the brass works. Reservoirs, such as the one on the Mill River, were part of a systems approach to seasonal water shortages. The idea of using controlled releases from specially created reservoirs or existing lakes to improve flow patterns in dry months was not a new one. In Britain and in continental Europe, artificial storage was sometimes used to augment or replace natural flows for transportation or industrial purposes. Zachariah Allen may have been the first American to create a reservoir system for manufacturers. As a young entrepreneur building a new mill and dam in Rhode Island in 1822, Allen was distressed to experience an extended drought. After convincing other mill owners on the same river that preventing future water shortages would require group action and a systemic solution, he led them to incorporate the Woonasquatucket River Company in 1823. The multiple reservoirs they created over the next 15 years made their river system a much more reliable source of water power and allowed significant growth of industrial capacity uh, in the drainage basin. Heavy capital investment and political influence could create even bigger reservoir systems. Between 1845 and 1859, the proprietors of locks and canals in Lowell and the Essex Company in Lawrence gained control over more than 100 square miles of lake surface in three lake and stream systems that fed the Merrimack River. Lakes Winnipesaukee, Squam, and Newfound in New Hampshire 
became giant storage reservoirs serving the needs of the mills in Lowell and Lawrence. Hundreds of smaller lakes and mill ponds linked to the Merrimack or its tributaries were contributing elements of the system. The increased flow, combined with additions to the Lowell Canal system, allowed the proprietors of locks and canals to lease 50% more permanent uh, water power and to sell large amounts of surplus water most of the year. Francis could telegraph a message to one of the gate operators at a lake outlet when Lowell's mills needed more water. This is a view from the Pawtucket Gatehouse looking north toward New Hampshire. The uh, flashboards that you see here on the dam uh, increased the size of the, of the mill pond. There were two feet of flashboards in 1838, three feet in 1883 after a drought, and five feet in 1890s. <clears throat> the vast mill pond, which stretched for 18 miles above the dam in Lowell, was also a tremendous asset. It could hold almost twice as much water as the combined ponds created by the Amiskeag Company's dam at Manchester and the Essex Company's dam at Lawrence. All three of the Merrimack's water-powered industrial centers benefited from releases of lake water that moved down the river and into their ponds. But Lowell had more flexibility with its greater storage. Charles Starrow, the head of the Essex Company, complains that that he had to order extra water from the lakes when, quote, your better means of holding it in your pond render it unnecessary for you. We find almost no textile mills scrapping their breast wheels or turbines to run steam engines such as this Harris Corliss in their place. Certainly there were sites where water power was not a possibility or was too expensive to develop. Water wheels had more locational constraints than steam engines. Also, some mills needed process heat from exhausted or condensed steam for bleaching, dyeing, printing, and other uses. And that might make an engine unusually economical to operate. In cases like these, steam power was a logical choice for an initial installation or an expansion, but it was seldom a good replacement for already installed water power. Many of the developable water power sites in the United States were at isolated locations where there was sufficient flow and drop, but no transportation infrastructure or supply of capable workers. One of the principal objects of the thick uh, two volumes on uh, water power in the 1880s census was to call attention to locations where power could be advantageously developed. Although there were still many possible sites for water-powered industry in the 1880s, the authors recognized that some were technically difficult to use and that others were so remote that they were commercially valueless. Industrial archaeologist Robert Gordon has shown that water power resources were never exhausted even in New England, but quote, if the initial cost of a water power plant is excessive and there are no compensating savings on operating costs, an alternative power source would be chosen uh, by an entrepreneur. 19th century manufacturers who wanted an urban location and chose to locate in existing communities with inadequate or unavailable water power had little choice but to use steam for most of their power-intensive mechanized production. Human and animal power remained important in the United States, but limitations of muscles were obvious. Steam engines and boilers, despite the danger of fire or explosion, were common in urban settings by the mid-19th century. Steam was also the obvious choice to power machinery such as hoists, breakers, <coughs> and pumps at coal mines, where fuel was very cheap. Some manufacturers even had free fuel for steam boilers. Sawmills and woodworking shops produced piles of burnable scrap and sawdust. 
As the 1880 census said, quote, where fuel is cheap, the value of water power is correspondingly lessened. Even if fuel was not cheap, some industrial operations, such as the production of cast and wrought iron, created enough waste heat to generate steam in boilers. Vertical water wheels, which drove the bellows, trip hammer, and rolling and slitting mill at Saugus, Massachusetts in the 17th century, were still the typical prime movers at American waterworks, uh, I'm sorry, American ironworks in the early national period. But things changed rapidly once iron makers began to capture the waste heat from blast and puddling furnaces. Steam engines became the preferred power source at most plants before the 1870s. The Tredegar Ironworks at Richmond, Virginia, transitioned from vertical wheels to water turbines, but was unusual for its continuous dependence on water power. One explanation is that it had no blast furnaces, and it stopped puddling iron by 1880. The Tredegar complex, which received water at bargain rates from the James River and Kanawha Canal, was still operating 16 turbines in 1920. Its unusual use of heavy flywheels with many of those turbines was necessary to overcome sudden changes of load when rolling iron. Two halves of one flywheel remain here in this slide. The plant closed uh, in 1957. In Fall River, Massachusetts, where the small Kekachan River fell 129 feet over a short distance from the right to just left of center, water power attracted manufacturers of textiles and machinery. The early developers of this site on Narragansett Bay avoided the costly construction of power canals by using a tight series of eight drops with mills positioned directly over the stream. The modest drainage basin and low summer flows in the river were, however, serious handicaps for water-powered manufacturing. Water needs of the increasing urban population further diminished the flows to mills on the river. Fall River's phenomenal growth in the second half of the 19th century depended on the addition of steam power in large quantities. Luckily, the coastal location uh, of the city meant that transport costs for coal were very reasonable, and markets for fabric were readily accessible. By 1892, Fall River had twice the number of spindles of Lowell and was the greatest cotton textile producer in America. Steam had taken over, uh, but the very name of the city had evoked the power source that drove eight mills. Today, the river is hidden as it drops to the bay, except at two sites, including here at the Metacomet Mill, where there's a circular outline of a former penstock just uh, left of center. In Fall River, Pawtucket, Amesbury, and other riverine cities on the coast, the final drop was into changing levels of tidewater. Thus, the head at that mill privilege was not constant, and backwater could occur at high tide. In Amesbury, the old penstock entry and mortises for the last dam on the Powwow River are still visible. The dam was removed but Tidewater still affected a nearby hydroelectric station. Economic historian Lewis Hunter, whose writings on industrial power continue to inform new generations of scholars, concluded that, quote, the primacy of water power during the early stages of American industrialization is an important fact in the history of Western technology refuting the widespread assumption that steam power reduced water power to obsolescence. The record of industrial development in Britain, which was so dependent on steam, has distorted common historical interpretations. There were other countries, such as France, that relied more heavily on water power than on steam power. 
but, quote, in no instance was the diversity and scale of the American experience approached. Even Hunter's assessment may underestimate the extent of water power domination in the United States. He accepted questionable statistics that seemed to show the use of steam power slightly exceeding that of water power in 1870. Close examination of Lowell uh, after that year demonstrates that much of the rapidly increasing steam capacity was in hybrid power systems that combined steam engines with water turbines. Many of those steam engines were not really in regular use. They were supplemental, held in reserve for most of the year while surplus water, extra flow uh, beyond the least or permanent water power supported production. Steam power did surpass water power by 1880 in the United States, although probably not in Lowell, whose raison d'etre was Pawtucket Falls. Technical improvements in boilers and engines, as well as mining and transport of coal, had cut the costs of steam. It also had the great advantage of being mobile. A boiler and an engine could be set up almost any place that had access to some type of combustible fuel. Although thick smoke was already becoming a serious problem in St. Louis and Pittsburgh, many people saw the billowing emissions from industrial smokestacks as signs of economic progress. The value of clean or at least smokeless water power for industry, however, was soon to receive a technological boost. Electrical power generated by either steam or water would soon change the way factories operated and make elaborate canal systems like the ones in Lowell or Cohoes seem like anachronisms. A hydroelectric station at a waterfall linked to a network of transmission lines could provide alternating current efficiently for manufacturing far from the hazardous banks of a river. Buffalo and Syracuse, New York, both of which had excellent transportation infrastructure and substantial workforces, would benefit from the vast power at Niagara Falls. And power plants on both sides of the river supplied power uh, to American cities in New York. Enormous concrete dams, such as the 726 foot high Hoover Dam, built between 1831 and 1835 on the Colorado River, and great storage reservoirs like Lake Mead made even relatively arid regions of the American West suitable for hydroelectric development. The Columbia River became the largest source of hydropower in the United States. In the 20th century, electric motors used first on sections of line shafts and later on individual machines transform shop floors all over America. We are still using substantial amounts of water power as one way to generate electricity for American industry. Thank you. Am I on the mic? Thank you. Um, Pat, thank you for that talk that um, put our experience here in New England into, into a wonderful context, both geographically and temporally. So thank you very much for that. Um, do we have questions from the audience? Well, I have a question here from our chat. Um, how large were the original water wheels and exactly how was the power originally transmitted to the machinery? Could you repeat that again, Kate? I'm a little... Certainly. How big were the original water wheels? And how exactly was the power originally transmitted to the machinery? <clears throat> well, the size of the water wheels uh, depended uh, primarily on the actual drop at a particular site. 
So the, uh, the Merrimack Manufacturing Company, which <coughs> had a 30-foot drop, had a huge 30-foot water wheel. Uh, the uh, smaller sites had wheels of, that really matched the drop at their site. High breast wheels are often uh, the same diameter as the actual fall. The width of the wheel varies, however, so that if you had a small water wheel in diameter, uh, you could compensate by making that wheel longer. In Lowell, some of the wheels, which were in individual pieces, uh, stretched for 80 feet. So you, you had some very, very big wheels. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the development of, uh, of water power it really depends on these water wheels. And what is the, the second half of the question? How was it transmitted? Okay. The transmission was originally with gearing and shafts, uh, but that was quite inefficient. It burned up a lot of energy. And in the late 1820s, uh, Lowell began to move to main belt drive using large belts and pulleys. And that's primarily a development uh, due to uh, uh, to Paul Moody, who was from uh, Waltham. And in fact, he recommends in 1831 that Waltham scrap its shafts and go to belts. We're not quite sure how fast they did that. Uh, but with main belt drive, uh, you could run belts up through the various floors of a mill uh, and drive line shafts on every floor. Audience? Yes. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, tell us something about how the smaller rural mills in Rhode Island might have designed their waterworks. But uh, if they didn't have a, a bright engineer like uh, James Francis or Paul Moody to come down to consult with them, uh, they, of course, we know they had little handbooks like Oliver Evans, but uh, were there uh, consulting engineers that would go on horseback and show them how to do it? How, how did that come about? Really, it's a, it's a craft tradition, the millwriting tradition. <clears throat> and millwrights uh, would consult, go to particular sites and take on uh, the development of a water power system, a wheel and power transmission at a particular site. <clears throat> if you had uh, a larger site, then you might indeed uh, get a consulting engineer, although they were relatively few and far between until the 1830s and 40s. Uh, but once you have uh, complex sites where you have to uh, distribute the water between people who own fractional amounts of the power, uh, then you sometimes really have to get an engineer uh, to solve the distribution problem, as we saw in Woonsocket. Pat, you were talking about uh, the drop in a river, and Judith McGaw said that New Englanders established mills at, on small streams, any place that had a 10-foot fall. When you talk about a river that has a 40-foot drop, for example, um, or a 10-foot fall, is that over a particular distance? What made a small river suitable for a, 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 a water-powered mill? <clears throat> well, you, you really have a drop that's often over a considerable distance. Uh, and if you have a long head race or a long tail race, uh, you can place your mill in the middle of that drop and pick up the entire drop. Uh, you also have uh, the issue of uh, <clears throat> the concentration of the drop at one point. So although you might have a natural rapid with a fall of 20 feet over a half a mile, by building a dam, you could concentrate it at one point. Then you would not have to uh, 
build as long a, a head race or tail race to take advantage of it. Uh, and I do think that we should realize that there are a lot of different types of wheels, however, mm -hmm. and some operated fairly well with low heads or low drops. Uh, and undershot wheels, for instance, uh, really could run with, uh, with extremely fast current in a rapid and still generate enough power for a small grist mill or sawmill. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now we had another question. I was wondering if you could recommend uh, where the, currently where a site that is well interpreted that the public might visit that might be a good example of what you have spoken about this evening. Kate, could you re repeat that? My hearing is not great. Is there a site we can visit today that you would recommend that would show this technology in, in operation? <clears throat> well, I would have said uh, the Slater Mill Historic Site uh, in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, <clears throat> where, uh, where I built an operating water wheel, but the wheel is, uh, is now fallen on hard times. But there's, uh, there's hope that uh, uh, the National Park Service, which has taken over Slater Mill Historic Site, uh, will uh, rebuild the wheel and put it back in shape, and then you can really see it. Uh, in Lowell, uh, you can see demonstration of turbines uh, at the Wana Lancet con uh, complex, and sometimes they actually run uh, the belt drive as well. Uh, but uh, for smaller scale mills, uh, there are occasional operation uh, at places like uh, the Taylor Sawmill in New Hampshire. Sturbridge Village is one good place to see uh, much of the early national period technology, uh, including uh, some uh, reaction wheels. Any other? I was just wondering, um, in the winter, do they have problems with ice and the rivers, and how do they deal with it? It's a, it's a good question. Uh, you don't have any problem with ice if it freezes completely across the canal. Uh, wet ice is pretty slippery, as we probably know, so the water moves easily beneath it. The problem is when you have broken ice that comes down the canal and then blocks the trash racks uh, at your, uh, your head race, and it, you can jam it up completely. There's also a phenomenon known as anchor ice or frazzle ice, where tiny hooks of ice, almost microscopic, uh, hook together and create mats of ice, and uh, anchor ice uh, sometimes forms on rocks on the bottom of a canal, and rises to the surface, comes down, and then creates a mat across your, uh, your trash rack. So you have to get out there and clean the trash racks. So yes, ice can be a severe problem. Uh, and in some cases, uh, in very cold climates, uh, and this was true even in Minneapolis, uh, some of the upstream sources of water would freeze up completely, or there would be an ice jam, uh, and you would have no power, uh, or very reduced power, until that jam broke. We have a question from the chat. Could you speak a little bit about the transition from water wheels to turbines? Yes, I think that that transition is one of the most important uh, technological changes in American industry. The, uh, the, the vertical water wheel uh, had its limitations. It was big, uh, it was hard to build, took up a lot of room. Uh, its efficiency was somewhat limited. People tend to exaggerate the efficiency of these high breast wheels. When I actually looked at the tests the only tests that were really done on a full-scale breast wheel by James Francis, uh, the efficiency uh, really never rose above 62% on that particular wheel. It was a relatively small one. You get a little higher efficiency with the 30-foot wheel of the Merrimack. 
Uh, <clears throat> but I think the efficiency is, uh, is an important issue. A turbine was much more efficient. Uh, the efficiency range of turbines would be from 70% uh, up to the high 80%. Uh, and, and that's a significant advantage. But the one thing that people fail to see is that the big problem with the vertical water wheel was backwater. So every time you had a freshet in your river, water would rise into the wheel pits. And although breast wheels, because of their direction of rotation, uh, worked better in backwater than overshot wheels, uh, they still were adversely affected. The efficiency dropped like a rock. And if you had more than two or three feet of backwater, it would likely just stop your wheel. Uh, and that, of course, is something that happens at tidal uh, operations uh, regularly. Uh, the tidal cycle inevitably results with high tide rising and creating backwater that, that stops your wheel, unless you're using the perpetual system in Boston. So I think backwater was a huge issue. And turbines are not affected by backwater. The only thing that uh, affects the turbine when the river rises is that you may have less head, less difference between the upper level and the lower level, uh, but you do not have a change in efficiency. It does not drop off. Uh, <clears throat> and that was a, a significant uh, improvement, and one that James Francis used to sell turbines uh, to, uh, to people in Lowell. The transition in Lowell uh, begins in the 1840s and accelerates in the 1850s and during the Civil War. There are so many uh, influences on uh, what causes uh, manufacturers to change their technologies, though. Um, we were talking a little bit before the program about Marty Frank's work, and she said that Patrick Tracy Jackson was actually uh, prejudiced against steam engines because of a very visible uh, explosion, explosions at the Fairmount Waterworks in Philadelphia. Oh. So uh, do, you, do you think that, uh, that there were other forces that, that influenced the adoption of technology and steam engine as well? Because explosions really were a concern with steam, weren't they? Yeah. I, th I think you, you do have a fear of steam explosions, a justifiable fear. There are some significant uh, accidents in New Bedford where, <coughs> where I've looked closely at steam power applications. The, uh, the movement from one technology to another is influenced by, by many factors. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that uh, in a clipping that Bob Perry uh, that the Boston Manufacturing Company uh, <clears throat> in 1902 was uh, making a huge investment uh, in improving its steam power mm -hmm. so that it could run everything with steam power if necessary. And the reason for that was the terrible uh, warm weather uh, flow River. It had been a problem ever since the Boston Manufacturing Company came to this site, uh, <clears throat> but w it was getting worse. Uh, some of the water was being diverted for domestic use in Cambridge, for instance. Uh, a good bit of it went into Mother Brook uh, over to the Neponset River. Uh, <clears throat> and this, this newspaper article really uh, points out the liability uh, of low water. It says that since April, uh, we were seldom able to get more than 25 horsepower from our new turbines. Wow. So that's not real impressive. Right, right. And of course, so the, then the manufacturer needed the capital to be able to transition to a new technology. And also, uh, I imagine whether they owned or they leased the land, they needed the space to make the changes that they wanted to make, whether it was adopting a new transportation system or um, 
or uh, expanding the mill. I, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, our, our mill here at the Boston Manufacturing Company. Um, when we take people on walking tours, we point out how the expansions ran all along the river, parallel to the river, until the 1870s when the Boston Manufacturing Company started to expand out in that direction perpendicular to the river because now they were using steam. But they had the space to be able to do that. Yeah. They had the land to be able to do that. In some cases, they, they're planning ahead and they pick up a big site. In other cases, uh, your cost of new technology involves the cost of demolishing your old technology or your old mill. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in many cases, even though it might make a lot of sense to run a better technology, the cost of tearing down your old mill and building a new one uh, <coughs> with new technology uh, might be uh, intimidating. Mm -hmm. Another factor uh, that we really have to think about, uh, though it's not important with water power development, uh, <clears throat> is that uh, labor issues are often involved in technological decisions. So if you're going to buy a new technology, uh, that means you can use unskilled labor instead of skilled labor, uh, that might be the economic benefit that tips you uh, into innovation. We often think of uh, 19th century transportation improvements as being uh, built with a combination of, at, at various times during the period, either public or private funding. But we usually think of the manufacturing sites as privately funded. Was the Augusta, Georgia site exceptional? Yes, I think that was fairly exceptional. <clears throat> I mean, there were ways for communities to subsidize power, uh, power developments. In Minneapolis, they were, they were glad to have the power development, <clears throat> and they provided a number of subsidies that helped uh, build dams and canals. <clears throat> but I think Augusta was really unusual in, in that the city started investing, and then almost immediately just took it over and said, we're going to run it. Uh, which, of course, gave them the option to use it for public uh, water pumping as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's less common. Uh, you, don't, you don't see a lot of public takeover, at least in that era. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, any more questions from the audience? I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the uh, adoption of steam. You mentioned it as being primarily as a hybrid power source for when the water flow is low. Um, I wonder if you could comment about the effect of the cost of not just buying the coal or uh, other fuel, but delivering it. And, and did that restrict which plants could practically use steam? In other words, you had to be near enough to a source of transportation to haul the coal in, I suppose. And, uh, and also, you mentioned labor. Wouldn't steam also require more skilled labor to operate the steam plant and the, and the, and the uh, uh, steam machinery than you would maybe require for water machinery? So I wonder if you could talk some more about the economics of steam and when, that, when did that adoption occur in typical New England plants, if, if it did? Well, the adoption of steam is, is something I, I looked at rather closely in an article I did in IA <coughs> focusing on New Bedford, uh, and it was really instructive. Uh, it's true that uh, the level of, uh, of skill involved uh, might actually uh, increase if you had sophisticated steam power development uh, operating an engine. Also, the downside of operating a boiler badly and blowing it up uh, might mean that you'd be willing to pay uh, for that expertise. <clears throat> the, uh, the whole choice of uh, water power versus steam power in a, in a case where both are going to be used uh, is, is very interesting because what I've discovered is that water power, once you have the dam and the canal and your prime mover, is very inexpensive compared with steam where you have to have fuel. 
Now, I've mentioned a number of ways that you might cut the cost of fuel, or in fact, eliminate it entirely if you were doing a woodworking operation and burning uh, scraps. Uh, <clears throat> but in many cases, you're paying significantly more for the steam power, and yet you really need it in many water power locations because the water power is not even all year. You're going to have dry seasons where you really don't have a lot of water power. And if you want to install enough machinery uh, to use all of that water power, uh, you can do that, but then if the water drops off in the summer, uh, you're going to have to fill in with some other power source. And that's where auxiliary steam comes in. And there's a lot of auxiliary or supplemental steam. The Wilkinson Mill in Pawtucket uh, in 1810 is uh, perhaps the first mill that was built with a hybrid power system. It had both a water wheel and a steam engine in 1810. What you would do in a situation like that is run the steam engine as little as necessary because that's where you're paying for the fuel and run the water power as much as you can. Now, since water power is available in large quantities in spring freshets, for instance, uh, you may be able uh, to operate a large amount of textile machinery using water power for three quarters of the year and then fill in with steam power uh, so that you can keep that same level of manufacturing going all year, even in the dry season. And that's, that's a big incentive uh, for backing up uh, your, uh, your water wheels uh, with uh, steam engines. Speaking of the, of the uh, entire system of the water power, the mills, the workers, when, when mills needed water for industrial processes, uh, for um, dyeing or for uh, sanitation or maybe later even for fire suppression, did, they, did that water follow the canals into the buildings or did they uh, have separate systems of piping for the water? Well, a place like Lowell has, you know, an ample system. <clears throat> what they, uh, they would do is use some of their water a lot for process water. And France would measure the flow in the canal. I mean, you can put a meter on your turbine were using process water as well. He liked to measure in the canal how much water was actually going to your mill. So they'd be, in effect, charging you for the process water. In terms of uh, waste, uh, you think that uh, any liquid is good for power, but Francis didn't really want them putting their toilets directly uh, into the canal system. He didn't care to put it in the tail race and into the river, but he didn't like to foul his canal system for various reasons. <laughs> so that he... The city of Lowell wanted to use the water in the canal as part of their emergency uh, fire prevention or, or fire extinction system. But Francis uh, was a little hesitant to do that. He worked out some sharing arrangements, but he didn't like uh, to, to give up his water uh, unless he had to. Uh, he, for instance, uh, resisted the use of the Merrimack River as the source for Lowell's water in the 1870s uh, because he was going to use the water that would be coming into uh, his canals. Mm -hmm. And people said, well, you know, this water is important. Hydrants, it'll improve public health. Uh, but Francis said, you know, it's 
or water. Uh, and the city got to take the water by court action mm -hmm. that they needed, but they had to pay locks and canals for that water. So when the city took water from the Merrimack and pumped it into mains in the city, uh, it was an initial payment, a substantial payment to, uh, to compensate the proprietors of locks and canals for the loss of that water. Was all of the regulation of the waterways, is that all, is all that regulation, Pat, a product of the progressive era of the turn of the 20th century? In other words, in the 19th century, were all these issues relegated to being worked out by lawsuits? I think in many cases, it is primarily lawsuits or common law practices. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we're, we're dealing with an English tradition Oh, much of that is carried over to America, so they've gone through this before. Uh, but what happens over time in the 19th century is uh, an increase in the power of the corporation because the, uh, the manufacturing that corporations do is considered a public benefit. And so you start seeing uh, <coughs> corporations allowed to do more and more all because supposedly supporting the economy, hiring people, uh, <clears throat> and you know, generating income for the community. Mm -hmm. But I think over time, they went a little too far in many cases. And that's where we start seeing the progressive era mm -hmm. step in and say, that's enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and they never cracked down heavily, uh, but they did uh, alleviate of the problems, some, some of the uh, practices that uh, corporations use uh, to benefit themselves at the expense of the community. Mm -hmm. Any other audience questions? Well, we were talking about the, we were talking about fire suppression and I was thinking how appropriate it is that we're standing here in front right. of Waltham's first fire engine, first uh, steam pumper, uh, which may have drawn water from the Charles River. Well, uh, oh. We have found in looking over the fire protection drawings for this building that there was a uh, water intake into the river uh, at some point along the back wall, and they had a you know, fairly substantial fire pump. So they did draw out of the river, you know, downstream of the canal for fire protection. Hmm. Also, uh, for some consulting work I did maybe 20 years ago, I was in Lawrence, and they had a fairly substantial private fire protection network where they tied several of the mills, several of the different mills, fire pumps together to provide, you know, source of fire water. And again, I'm not sure where the fire pumps uh, obtained their water, just as an observation. Well, in Lowell, uh, James Francis uh, wanted to have his own corporate reservoir <clears throat> at a very high elevation so that there would be enough head uh, to spray water from a hose in any mill yard over the top of every mill in the mill yard. Uh, and he actually built that in 1849. And then the corporations were required to pump, either with water power or steam power, enough water up into that reservoir to keep it full. Now the interesting thing is that when he was working on the uh, gate system at the, uh, <clears throat> the Francis Gate Complex, the sluice gates, not the flood protection gate, he wanted to mechanize it, but there was no drop at the site. So he couldn't use a turbine like he did at the Pawtucket Gatehouse. So, what he did was really ingenious. First, he was going to go with a steam engine, but if you had to open and close the gates, you'd have to get up 
a head of steam, so it might take some time, and it's also expensive. And then he realized that he had pressure in the fire main system that he'd built. And so he ran a pipe all the way from the fire main system out to the Francis Gate complex, and he put hydraulic rams on the gates, and he ran those with fire main pressure. And so that was always available, and all you had to do was turn it on, and the hydraulic rams would, uh, would raise or lower the gates. Well, I think we could keep talking about this all evening. It's absolutely fascinating, but I think that, uh, that we need to wrap up. Um, I would like to thank all of you for coming this evening. This has been a wonderful program. Pat, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us. And thank you to everyone at home. And we hope you've enjoyed the program. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>